Well, good evening. My name is Bill Purcell, director of the Institute of Politics, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome each and every one of you to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Tonight, we're pleased to host a conversation with Alec Baldwin and Rick Burke, national editor of the New York Times. Rick has a long history with the IOP and the Kennedy School. He's been a member of the IOP Senior Advisory Committee since 1999, and he was an IOP Resident Fellow in 1997. In 2007, Rick was a visiting adjunct lecturer affiliated with the Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy. Uh, our investigative staff has just today discovered, uh, via an unnamed source at the New York Times, that Rick watched It's Complicated last night to prepare <laughs> for tonight's okay. forum. How could I, how could I t interview Alec Baldwin and not have seen his latest movie? So I was, I was on DVD last night for the first time, so I was up till 1 a.m. watching it. And it was, I read the New York Times this Good, morning. good, good. <laughs> Rick is going to be interviewing and has already begun interviewing our guest, Mr. Alec Baldwin. Mr. Baldwin is known throughout America and the world for his roles on Broadway, television, and in over 40 films, including IOP's staff favorite, The Departed, for those of you here in Boston, The Departed. Most recently, you know him from 30 Rock, a role for which he has won two Emmy Awards, three Golden Globes. And yet, in pursuing a successful acting career, Alec Baldwin has maintained an active life in the realm of politics. He sits on the board of the political advocacy group People for the American Way and has broadly engaged in public policy advocacy and campaigns. Shortly after our leader and our senator, Edward M. Kennedy, passed away last year, Mr. Baldwin posted a reflection on Huffington Post recounting his involvement in the senator's 1994 re-election campaign. After traveling throughout the state and speaking at colleges and universities in support of Senator Kennedy, Mr. Baldwin received a call from the senator, thanking him for his service in one of his most contested races. After hanging up the phone, Mr. Baldwin describes the surge of emotions that overtook him, and I quote, Then I looked out the window and started to cry. I would believed in this man and in various members of his unique family all my life. I would campaigned for many men and women seeking public office, but here was one instance where I was able to believe that I had placed one brick in the wall of that 94 effort. Kennedy, a man who lived a life of service, had infected me with that spirit. It was 1960 or 1968 again. Ted inspired me to remember that politics, though spiritually demoralizing much of the time, is really the great calling. It is what matters most. Please join me in welcoming Rick Burke and Alec Baldwin. Thank you. Alec, I'm thrilled to have you here. This is going to be a lot of fun. We have a million questions about politics, about acting, about all kinds of things that you may or may not want to talk about. But before we, um, we go there, um, I have to ask you about what you're doing later tonight. And this involves where you're staying. Because Harvard is putting him up in a dorm room. But it's not just any dorm room. It's John F. Kennedy's old dorm room that's the newly renovated, so you're the first guest in the newly renovated John F. Kennedy dorm room where he wrote Profiles in Courage and did a lot of other things, who knows what else. But, <laughs> um, but let me just say that there's no TV in the room, so what are you gonna, what's someone like you do in a dorm room? Like when, was, when did you last sleep in a dorm room and what are you gonna do there? Um, well, I was mentioning earlier when we were backstage, uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you for coming. It's really sweet of you to come. I appreciate that. Do they teach classes in this room? Because <laughs> it must be tough for the people way up there to absorb everything. Um, the, I was saying how it is just nothing like when I come to Harvard, I've been here a few times, because Harvard can play off of being Harvard uh, by saying, you know, we're not going to pay you an honorarium to come speak here, but you're going to stay in JFK's dorm room. <laughs> And there's no wireless access in the room, and there's no <laughs> DVD. It's just a kind of a bed and a copy of Profiles and Courage and a lamp. <laughs> and you just have the experience of kind of recreating the Kennedy ethos in this room when you're there. Um, the last time I stayed in a dorm room, I don't remember. I mean, I, went to, I lived in the dorm. I went to GW first in Washington and was a political science major. 
and lived in the dorm there, and then transferred to NYU and lived in the dorm uh, uh, for the year and a half I went to NYU before I graduated. And, uh, uh, but I haven't stayed in a dorm in a while. How about you? It's Are you been, staying in the dorm I, with me? No, I'm not staying with you. Sorry, sir. I stayed there before it was renovated. They only give famous people like that stay in the new. Did they renovated. renovate it for me? Is what you're saying? I don't no. know about that. I don't know. But you mentioned GW. Um, when you went political science major, you clearly have a passion for politics. You did then a passion for acting, obviously. So, but but politics came first. Right? Yeah, I went mean, to GW to, to so study uh, political science. You wanted to go to law, you wanted to go I wanted to law, to go to law school. school right. Did you ever want to go into politics yes, when you were younger? Yes, very, very badly, yeah, very so badly. What, so what happened? How did you end up in this wayward route to start Well, you know, I went, to, um, I, I, I went to the acting school, and, <clears throat> I, I, and a friend of mine encouraged me to audition, and I auditioned. And I know this sounds, you know, kind of crazy, but um, I... Uh, the, I went to NYU, which was more expensive to attend then than GW. Uh, GW was not what it is now, 30 years later. Um, but uh, I went to NYU, but it cost me less money to go there because they gave me a scholarship. They gave me a, uh, the drama program gave me a scholarship to go there. And uh, that was kind of important for me. You know, it was really kind of determinative for me to go to a school under conditions I could afford. I mean, today, uh, great schools like this who have enormous endowments and can afford to uh, bring anybody here they want to that makes for a better campus environment for them academically. They can, they can just cop them, they can pay for them. I mean, how, many people here, how many people here go to school here and they, like what percentage, they don't have to pay any of their tuition, they're on a full scholarship? Raise your hand. No, 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 I'm not asking you people, I'm saying. No, no, raise your hand. <laughs> I mean, how many of the general population here go, don't, don't have to pay to go to school? It's a, a substantial amount, right? They pay for a lot of people to go here. Yeah, that's great. So I, um, yeah, they, it wasn't like that when I went to college. Getting the money to go to college, it was, it was harder than it is now. And uh, <clears throat> so I went and I started working right away in my business and I worked and it really just became about working. It was a job. You know, I, I, I wanted to work and earn an income and not be a burden to my parents and my family and everything. And I still had the passion for politics, which along the way in the entertainment community, different people would aid and abet that cause and plug you into different things. Norman Lear with People for the American Way, I joined that board. And he's a good example. Candidacies that you worked on. I went to the, um, uh, I went to the uh, Democratic Convention in Atlanta. In Atlanta in 1988 uh, as a guest of the California delegation, uh, um, uh, Tom Hayden brought us as his guest. Now, this was uh, aside from uh, Dukakis running against, uh, uh, was Duk Dukakis was running against Dukakis. Bush. Uh, it was uh, also the famous Rob Lowe That's video. What, I almost, a, a, yeah, a, a, yeah. Thank you, thank yeah, you. I want, yeah, you brought it up. So, <clears> thank yeah. you. Um, uh, I'm glad that the New York Times tracks all this stuff. Yeah, you know I mean? yeah, it's very The important. porn and the, yeah. uh, the, the convention. So this was the famous Rob Lowe <laughs> video episode. Yeah. And we were there with uh, Rob Lowe and all the people from the California uh, convention. Not in the room. No, I would, no, yeah. no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the last time I was in a dorm room was with Rob. Yeah. Um, you, just read my, you just refreshed my memory, thank you. Um, but long story short is that uh, uh, I went there, and that was my first introduction to members of the Kennedy family on more of a kind of an intimate level. Tom had a book that came out. Uh, Ethel Kennedy had a book party at her daughter Courtney's house soon after the convention. And that launched me into uh, working with Bobby Kennedy Jr. for what was then Hudson Riverkeeper. Then he formed the umbrella organization Waterkeeper Alliance. And, uh, uh, and I've worked with them since then. And I met Michael six years later on that path, the late Michael Kennedy, and he plugged me into this race where we came up here and we drove around Massachusetts for like four consecutive weekends the month of October, like as we got close to the election, and Kennedy won. And, uh, uh, you know, I remember going to GW in 76 and joining the College Democrats there and canvassing for Carter door to door in Maryland and suburban Maryland and Virginia. So um, it's, it's been tough for me because I do care a lot about politics and I've fantasized about doing other things with my life. 
but I'm grateful for those organizations that allowed me, with what I do for a living, to continue to plug into these things over time. When, when I heard you were coming, it made me think back to another um, famous actor who was on the stage talking about politics, and that was Barbara Streisand. And that was 1995, a packed house here in the forum. Um, she gave a speech called The Artist as Citizen, and she said, I'm not suggesting that actors run the country, but she said, I just like being involved. Right. Do you see her as a role model? Do you, do you share her sort of view of politics and celebrity? I, I, I can't say yes. I, I can't say no. I know that she's someone who, uh, in the most general sense, a, a lot of the people that I uh, like and that I'm fond of in the entertainment world, uh, they, as, as, they, they as well as I do, think that we have to have a constant countermeasure in American government to the influences of corporate power, which we think tilt the advantages of the services that government provides and where government money goes to. Uh, those are tilted toward the rich and the powerful. And uh, I believe that you need to have a countermeasure to that. I, I believe in a government that will ultimately at least try, they don't need to succeed, but at least try to do the most amount of good for the greatest number of people that they can. You know, my political opposites will say to you that they, you know, wanted Clinton to kill welfare reform. You know, they wanted Clinton to chop off the head of welfare as we know it in this country. And Clinton obliged them. He killed welfare reform as a, as a, as a, 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 a an act of uh, conciliation toward the Republicans that were then running the Congress starting in 1994. And <clears throat> there's so many of those kinds of uh, uh, movements that have come up in political life in the last 20, 25 years, uh, in the last 30 years since Reagan, that I might have supported if there had been a homogeneity of that kind of political thought in other things. Like if, if Newt Green Gingrich and company, and people like that, had made a contract with America where they were going to seek an end to defense fraud and fraud in defense contracting that would have netted us far more money than the money that was spent uh, defrauding the government in well. I mean, the amount of money that people defrauded the government in welfare fraud was minuscule compared to the fraud that's, that's uh, caused by defense contracting fraud. But they never bring that up. So they, 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 they act on behalf of a certain group of interests. And, uh, uh, and I, it always troubles me, because I would like to see those measures applied more uniformly. When Does someone have a baby? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> was that your baby? <laughs> that's, 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 that's so strange. When, when, you, when you talk politics, just for fun, do you, do you talk to fellow actors? Do you talk to political people? I mean, who do you like talking politics with? Well, um, most of my friends are not in my business. They're not actors in my business. Most of them are writers and novelists and journalists and screenwriters in New York and so forth. And some of them are people who, a very dear friend of mine who went on to become my own publicist was the communications director for the New York State Democratic Committee. Uh, he went to uh, uh, Cornell and graduated from Fordham Law School. His name is Matthew Hiltzik. He was actually going to come with us today. And he went on to, uh, before he got into public relations, he worked for Harvey Weinstein and did corporate PR for uh, uh, um, Miramax Films. He was the communications director for Judy Hope when she was very successful in New York in getting uh, Schumer elected and Hillary Clinton elected. Uh, he, he's uh, very connected to the uh, Jewish community in New York, so he did, did Jewish community outreach for Hillary's campaign. Uh, <clears throat> he's someone who uh, I, I really enjoyed. We did a lot of work for, for, him, for uh, Chuck and for Carl McCall, raising money for Carl McCall when he ran for governor unsuccessfully. So people that I think are like in the process and who are in involved and can tell me, uh, you know, and can explain to me the realities of what, what's happening. Like, like I live in, on Long Island in the eastern, first district of Long Island where Tim Bishop is the Democratic congressman. It's a safe seat for Democrats. And uh, uh, people have always come to me and said, are you going to run for office? And I say, well, you know, where would I run? What would I run for? I mean, you know, you've got a safe seat uh, uh, in my congressional district, and Andrew Cuomo is pretty much going to waltz right into the governor's office in New York, most people presume, unless they find out that he's got some scandal under his uh, skirt there. Um, and, uh, and I was bothered, for example, by the fact, and Bishop, who I support, but I was bothered by the fact that he voted for the war. 
and I wanted someone to explain to me the political realities of Brookhaven Township, where I live, which is the largest of the five townships that make up the congressional district. And you know, I, I like having people in my life that I, could, could, I can call who could explain to me the whys and wherefores of like, as goes Brookhaven Township, so goes the first district in New York. And it's a very, very conservative group of people. The Brookhaven town supervisor was almost always a Republican. So when they vote Democrat for a, a, a race, it's got to be a very moderate Democrat who, which I don't think I would qualify for that. And uh, so Tim wins that seat, and I think he's running for like his fifth term. You, you mentioned skirts in New York State politics and so forth. What's, what's your, um, you know, you, you think of Hollywood types as being pretty open about people's personal lives. What's your view of, say, um, Governor Spitzer, should he have stepped down after the you know, prostitute um, revelation came out? What do you think of Governor Stanford in South Carolina and his, hike, his, his, his non-hike on the Appalachian Trail? What do you think of Senator Vitter? What do, you, do you think people care too much about these politicians' personal lives? Well, I think, I think you have to get, uh, I, I mean, I think you have to accept the fact that Americans are pretty uh, um, uh, uptight about sex in, in that arena. You know, like you could have a president who, um, uh, who'd struggled with alcoholism for decades before assuming office. And people are less concerned about that. And I'm not saying that they should be more or less concerned about any of it, but they, but they uh, you'd, have a pre you'd have a president who uh, uh, has a, 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 some kind of sexual uh, proclivities. I had a friend of mine explain to me, Stephen Wayne, I was mentioning to some of the students earlier, Stephen Wayne was the person who uh, taught the American presidency classes that I took in Washington years ago. And he kind of alluded to the fact that presidents, who've always been men up till now, um, they all need something to take the edge off. It's a stressful job, and even more so now as it's gone on. Now, which would you rather have? Would you rather have a president who was on some heavy medication, some anti-anxiety medication every day, who drank heavily, or he decided he had to have a fling with his intern in some closet every uh, couple of months? You know, it, it's, like, it's like finding people to do it, but finding people to do, but let's be practical, finding people to do this job <laughs> is, is tough. It's, 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 a, it's a difficult job. The men or women who would be best equipped to do this job don't want the job. They want to go out into the business world and they want to make millions and millions of dollars in stock options and run corporations. You have a certain type of person who seeks this job these days and they all tend to bring some, <coughs> pardon me, Obama smokes. You know what I mean? They've all got something they do to get through the day. And um, I don't judge them or uh, malign them. However, I think it was naive of Spitzer not to re realize the times we live in. Spitzer should have known if that came out, he was going to lose people's trust. We live in a society where automatically, if you, be if you betray your wife, if you betray your husband, if you betray someone who is primary in your life that you have an intimate relationship with, how can I be expected to trust you? If you lied to your wife, you're cooked. It's over. And he should have known that. And I think that it was really foolish of him. Because I remember I was on the set of a film when Elliot won, and I was somebody who supported Elliot. And here, I mean, again, as a very progressive Democrat, when uh, Pataki was done, we had three terms of Pataki. We had Pataki for 12 years in New York. And it was just like a blast of ether in your face every day, <laughs> by my estimation, in terms of political leadership. I mean, he, he was viewed as a puppet for Alphonse D'Amato and so forth and these other Republican statewide leaders. And when Elliot won, I remember I almost had tears in my eyes. I was on the set of a film, and Elliot Spitzer, this guy who was, this guy was the V12 engine. This super smart guy, this amazing guy was governor. We were so excited about the prospects, and then when it ended the way it ended, we were just flabbergasted. It was tragic. What, what, what actors who have gone into politics do you admire? I know you don't admire. <laughs> None. I know you don't. <coughs> I mean, I don't. I know you don't admire uh, Governor Schwarzenegger, and I don't know if it's because of his acting or it's because of his political views, but, but one. Well, no, but, but, I think, but I'm wondering, do you think it could be a third thing? Well, what third thing do you think it could be? The, the reason why you don't. Maybe right. you had some fight over a movie or something, and he got the role and you didn't, or something like that. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, but I wonder if What's you could think of a third thing. Well, you tell me what you think a third thing could be that you might be. 
his views. He's an. I'll give you some hints. Daryl Issa turning Gray Davis out of office. My point is, is that. I mean, Schwarzenegger was a person whose political credentials were he was the head of the President's Council on Physical Fitness. <laughs> he had never held elective office in this country, ever. Never, ever, ever, ever. And if you know the history of what happened in California, if you watch the smartest guys in the room and kind of bank it off of the whole Enron scandal, you know that Daryl Issa, the Republican congressman who made a fortune in some business he had, I forgot what it was, something to do with automobiles, maybe? Uh, uh, the automobile dealerships. Daryl Issa was a, was a big conservative from uh, um, uh, Orange County who launched, who kind of lit the fuse of the Gray Davis recall effort um, and was assumed he would be the beneficiary of that. Issa believed he would be the nominee. And once he got the fire going, once he rubbed the two sticks together and the thing was raging to engulf Davis, who was one of the great gentlemen in American political life. I mean, Davis was a great guy, very quiet, very reserved guy. Um, maybe too much so. Maybe he didn't fight back hard enough. But when you're the governor, and Enron is gaming the electrical grid, and you know that there are literally power shortages that are causing like traffic lights to go out. There are car accidents happening where like children are being killed in car accidents. There are hospitals that are losing power, and patients are dying on your watch and your governor, you knew he was cooked. I mean, it didn't matter that Enron helped to rig that power of failure in, uh, 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 in California. And Issa launched the, uh, the recall effort. Davis was recalled. And they tapped Issa on the shoulder and they said, it's not you. We're not going to go with you. We're not going to take you to the prom. We're going to go with this guy here who is the head of the President's Council on Physical Fitness. He's going to be. <laughs> He's going to be the governor of but, but I would say, from what I know about your views, they're probably closer to the Schwarzenegger than Issa's, which is more to the right. But I just think, I, I, I wouldn't want to see anybody, uh, 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 you know, who I thought was unqualified. I mean, I mean in, in posts that I've written, I've given it to Democrats as well, who I thought violated uh, my standard of campaign finance uh, uh, um, uh, beliefs. I, I, I'm a big believer that campaign finance reform is the linchpin of most of the problems in this country. We need to have public financing, full public financing of campaigns. The work that I did with different groups regarding public financing was done here. We worked with Marvin Kalb and the uh, uh, Shorenstein Center, the Joan Shorenstein Center for uh, Public Policy. And uh, uh, that was when Marvin Kalb had worked with people on what they call the Seven Sundays Project, where they wanted the um, uh, the seven consecutive Sundays leading up to the presidential race to be free TV, similar to what we have now. But if you realize that, that, that clean elections in a presidential cycle would cost, let's say, I mean, for real media saturation in all markets, for the national races only, would cost $4 billion. These were estimates that were made by certain groups. And then in a non-presidential cycle, in the off-season for the congressional races, it was $2 billion. It was half that. So in a four-year period, it's going to cost you $6 billion to have clean elections in this country. So I'm, a, I'm a big believer in that. And, uh, and those people who I think violate the ethic of that, like Corzine in, in uh, New Jersey, uh, Ariana's ex-husband, Michael Huffington, spent an ungodly amount of money. Michael Bloomberg in New York. I mean, you know, I mean, a lot of people in New York are having a tough time uh, letting go of the fact that Bloomberg bought himself a third term. And uh, I mean, I wrote this in Huffington Post. I said, Bloomberg's telling you that during the financial crisis, New York needs his business acumen in order to survive this storm and weather this storm. And the question I asked in Huffington was, does Bloomberg mean to suggest that if you don't give him a third term, he will withhold that business acumen? He will not give people his advice about how to solve the business crisis unless you give him, you change the term limits? Which Christine Quinn, the Democratic head of the city council, did. She, they gave Bloomberg what he wanted. And uh, I, I, I find that uh, people who violate those principles that are voluntary about campaign finance reform, Democrat or Republican. I have a lot of distaste for either of them. Now, um, this isn't a trick question. A very nice monogram on your cuff oh, there. Thank Michael. you very much. <laughs> um, th this is not a trick question, um, but uh, even though Sarah Palin thought it was when Katie Couric asked her this question, that is, um, what newspapers and magazines do you read? <coughs> Do you need a little time to think about this? I can see Russia from my house. <laughs> um, 
Isn't she great? Let's hear Patina. <laughs> I'm going to send her up here. Yeah. She is funny. She is funny. Um, I live in New York. I read the Times. I used to read all the papers. I used to read the Times and the Wall Street Journal and USA Today, the Post, the Daily News. I used to get all the papers delivered to my house. And now I don't have time. And like a lot of other people, I'm online. Not because I prefer to read online. I prefer, we were talking about this backstage, I prefer to read the paper. I prefer to not have to boot up a computer to read the paper. I prefer to have a paper in my hand every day. You know, in New York, somebody else is always doing the driving, so you can get a lot of reading done. You're in a cab, you're on the subway. Um, but because I'm booting up a computer for other reasons, I tend to do my email and, and uh, read the paper then. So I go to uh, Huffington to look for certain friends of mine. We talked about this backstage, how Huffington is a bit like Us Weekly now. <laughs> how many people here go to Huffington at all during the day? Yeah, like a surprising, not, not many, yeah. I mean, the Huffington, I, I, I complained to Ariana how Huffington is like, you know, uh, 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 you, you know, a uh, uh, labor department to investigate Massey. Right next to that is, you know, Britney lip syncs again. You know? <laughs> it's like the whiplash you get of all that crap on that no, page. I think Alec is right. You need to just read the New York Times and you'll get your You your need to read the New York Times. I, I wouldn't argue with that. That's yeah. all you need. And I go to a museum and I kind of go all around the country and look at headlines and front pages of different Now, papers. Now, just getting back to Sarah, because I think you've, you've said that she's beautiful and she's, I mean, beyond that, what? I'm what, not dead, Rick. Beyond, beyond I may that. I may be a Democrat, you, you, but you, I'm not dead. You, <laughs> uh, beyond. Beyond that, what, how would you, um, why is she so successful among a group of her um, supporters? And I mean, she's getting these TV contracts, she's, she's all over the place. Well, I think it's no mistake that um, uh, she's the first person to, to gain that situation, an attractive woman. Uh, uh, let, let's look at what's happened in anything that's, that involves media centricity in this country. Uh, turn on the TV uh, with the sound off and watch the news now. I mean, you, you, you know, I mean, Candy Crowley may be the only woman who doesn't look like she just popped off the runway who's reading the news or who just popped out of some, uh, you know, uh, uh, skin cream commercial who's reading the news on TV. There's a certain kind of person they want to put out there in the media and on she the news. She is terrific, by the way. Who, Candy, Candy Crowley? Yeah. yeah, no, I love yeah, Candy yeah. Crowley. And uh, <clears throat> the um, Palin has stepped in to fill that uh, a niche of uh, this kind of... Uh, uh, you know, easy on the eye, uh, uh, spokesmodel, if you will. But more importantly, the, 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 it, when you listen to the content of what she says, and you analyze the content of what she says, I mean, people are, uh, it's always easy to play off the fears of the American people. American people are afraid. They're afraid that they're either going to not get something that they already, that they don't have, or uh, they're, they're going to not get something that they want, or lose something that they already have. Americans are very afraid of a contraction of the American um, uh, standard of living. You tell Americans you're going to have to pay money for gas the way Europeans pay money for gas, like $8 a gallon. You tell Americans you're not going to be able to ride in cars, single driver car, single passenger cars as much, and you have to take more public transportation. You tell Americans you're going to have to eat less in restaurants, or I'm talking about middle class Americans, not poor people. You tell Americans they're going to have to do with less, and Americans get real, they get the hives, you know what I mean? They get, they get really kind of nervous, you know? You're, you're, <clears throat> you're so passionate about politics, and I, something, a question popped in my head that's so not New York Times, and I really shouldn't ask this, but I can't help myself. Would you date a Republican? Choking. Um, I have dated a libertarian, <laughs> but not a Republican. No. So I, you draw uh, the line there. Although I have to give a touche to Ann Coulter. I said, someone said to me, would you ever s sleep with Ann Coulter? And I said, I said, if I did, I would probably jump out the window and kill myself afterward. And her reply was, that might be reason enough to do it. <laughs>
a little nod for that. She's a very clever gal, that Anne. Now, she now, is. Let's, uh, let's jump a little to acting, because you speak, as, as I said, with such passion about politics. What excites you the most about acting? I mean, you're, so, you're, you're doing the Philharmonic, TMC, drama, comedy, plays, movies, everything. What, what's, what area excites you the most as an actor? Or is it the variety? Q&A with New York Times reporters. <laughs> um, well, I mean, you know, when you do something for a long time, I mean, most of the people here, uh, for, you know, not the people on the faculty or the staff, but the young people here, you know, when you're young, you uh, are, are, and you have an opportunity to come to a great institution like this, and you want to make the most of it, and you're going to study something uh, wonderful and have a great, you know, one of the greatest academic experiences in the world. Uh, you know, when you get older, it changes. I mean, I've been doing what I've been doing for 30 years and worked a lot. It hasn't been a lot of downtime. I've kind of lit one off the other and done a lot of films and television shows and so forth. And um, the, uh, you think about what you might have done. You think about other things you might have done. And I'm, I always say, for example, and it sounds a little glib, but I always say that um, acting is something you do when you have no musical ability. You know, when you can't sing or play the piano, you know, acting is like a fallback for the really moderately talented people in the performing arts. And I kind of feel that way sometimes. I, my work with the Philharmonic is maybe wish I'd studied music. And um, uh, acting is, uh, it's, uh, you, uh, sometimes you get to do something really thoughtful and really beautiful. Uh, on the, on, on the, on the, in the best of times, Acting, I think, is the most important way in film and theater to teach us what is interesting and what is beautiful and what there is to love in each other. It's a very human, uh, 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 um, uh, you know, uh, driven experience. You go to the theater and you you see a great play, and I think you 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 show people what there is to love about this life that we experience with each other. And the, the downside of it is there's jobs I've done to make money. It's how I make a living. And, uh, you know, it's as if someone said to a plumber, you'd go to the plumber and you'd say, I want you to install this cabinet in my bathroom. And the plumber says, yeah, this is how much that would cost me to install that cabinet in the bathroom. And then sometimes you, you, you never hear plumbers come in and say, I'm not going to install that cabinet in your bathroom. Mm. I wouldn't be caught dead mm. seen installing that cabinet in your bathroom. Like, that's so beneath me. The same thing is true with acting. Sometimes you sit there and go, you want to go to work. And you just, you know, just do the job and get paid, and you take the paycheck, but, and you go home. But that surprises me a little, because you describe it as work and a job. And, and don't you, don't, aren't there elements of it that you love? Or, I mean, how much is the love? Oh, no, what I'm saying is when you, when you use it, when you do a piece of material that's a wonderful piece of material, uh, I mean, I've, I've done plays where, uh, I mean, most of the time the experiences that are the, that are the most satisfying experiences are in the theater. Um, the experiences are that way in the theater because more thought went into the material. Uh, uh, when you do theater, much of the time you're reviving classic material, so you know the material works. If the production doesn't go over, you know it's you that's to blame. You know, and uh, the, the thing, and with films, very often the movie business, they're kind of in the potato chip business. You know what I mean? They're out to sell people kind of a quickie snack food. And it's not always fun making potato chips. For how, about, how about 30 Rock? Is that fun or is that a grind? Oh, no, it's great. I mean, I, I, I reached a point in my life where everything I liked about making films, I grew to dislike, which was that I never knew where I'd be six months from now. And in the film business, when you were young, that was exciting. You'd come home, and the phone would ring, and they'd say, you're going to Czechoslovakia. And you'd go, great. <laughs> and you were excited, and it was new and fun. And then when the TV show came, you know, you're going to stay in New York for six years and sign a six-year contract to do the show, which I did. And that was great, because I, I want to live one place and have a normal life and be a member of a community and be reliable. I mean, I've said this to people. Uh, ad nauseum, where you go do a film and you'd be sitting in your trailer and they would FedEx you your mail, your my assistant or my housekeeper or somebody. And I'd open my mail and it would say, you know, and you'd read the, the card and you'd realize there was one week left 
and the baking exhibit was going to close at the Metropolitan Museum, and you missed this, and you missed that, and you missed this person's graduation, and you missed this person's wedding, and you missed, and, and when you make films, you miss a lot. It's a very, very uh, time-intensive process, and you're their slave, and they own you, you know. And uh, when I do the TV show, uh, I'm home in New York, and I mean, my character on the show wears a suit and tie, and when we finish work at 7.30 or 8 o'clock at night, I literally wipe my makeup off, <laughs> get in the car, in my wardrobe, and I'm at a restaurant in Manhattan at 8.30 with my friends every night. So. <laughs> <laughs> been a good job. What good about job. Saturday Night Live? You have the record of appearances, right? Oh, Steve Martin has the okay, record Well, you're pretty yeah. close. The best. Um, well, <laughs> you, must, you obviously love doing that, or you wouldn't do it. You don't need the money. You really don't. They really don't pay you very much money. OK. Yeah. I think this is they a They pay you more than they pay you here. here. Right. So. <laughs> so here's See, my when you do Saturday Night Live, what they do is they put you in a dorm room. Yeah. That was Arturo Toscanini's dorm room at NBC. <laughs> It's, there's a violin on a table and a bed <laughs> and some CDs. Here's my question about Saturday Night Live. Those people that do those sketches at the, the opening when they have the guest people on, some of those people, big name celebrities, I could, I could walk on and do what they do. They don't act, they, don't, they, just, they just walk on stage and say hi to everyone. And, and what's, what does it take to really... Who, who are you referring to? Who? I'm not going to say. You say were they the host? The host. The host. Some of those hosts, you think, this is an actor, and they go on there, and, they, and all the other people do And the, the monologue work. in the beginning, you think, the is terrible. The monologue is, is, is right. nothing. It's all the other people that are the regulars do all the work. And the host just says, hi, everyone, and, and just is sort of the straight man on the show. And to me, that's not a good thing, right? <laughs> but you're the expert. So what's your so advice? So when the comedy sucks and the acting sucks, that's not a good thing. Right. right. So what's your advice to someone doing that show? to really do well on that show, and particularly on that opening monologue. God, I can't. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I think that when people do the show, the best thing is to try to be a member of the company. Um, the, uh, uh, like if you come on, like if you're Stallone, let's say, he's a, he's a good example of someone who you're gonna send up his career, you're gonna send up the iconography of Stallone's career, or somebody in, you know, Nicholson, if he ever did the show, he never would. But most people who come on, I think, who do a good show, you become a member of the company and you're there just to make an ass of yourself like they do. That's what comedy is, is just to really kind of make a fool of yourself. But I've done the show where they've come to me, it never, it's, it, 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 it was ever thus when I do the show, where they'll come to you and you start on Monday and it's a whole process you go through. And it really is kind of a miracle how they build a live, 90-minute show in, in six days. And um, you do the show, and uh, they come to you like on Friday. It's like the day before, you know? Like you can't back out. They're not gonna get somebody else now or whatever. And they come to you and they go, here's the monologue we got for you for tomorrow. And it's something like really asinine, <laughs> really like demoralizing, you know what I mean? Yeah. <clears throat> like I'll never forget when I first got divorced from my ex-wife. It was like I did SNL right after that. And, uh, uh, and uh, the writers came to me who, who can be kind of, and they all went to this school, by the way, they all are Harvard graduates. Yeah. They know they are, they're, and they're like sick beyond belief and uh, malicious. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, they come to me and, they, and he says, here's the monologue. And the monologue was Daryl Hammond, was Clinton, coming out and telling me how great it was gonna be for me to be single and to be rid of my ex-wife. <laughs> I don't know if anybody ever saw this thing. It was really very funny because Daryl comes out and he said, he said, Alec Baldwin, Alec Baldwin. <laughs> he said, I got to tell you, Alec. He said, you're going to have it running hot and cold on tap. <laughs> I mean, he goes into this whole like really disgusting monologue about how great it's going to be to be single. And I looked at them and I said, I can't do that. And they really, really guilt you into it. They're really like, oh, come on. <laughs> Oh, come on, man, this is good. And they bait you, they switch you, they give you like three monologues, they're very clever. They give you like a really shitty monologue <laughs> and a pretty shitty monologue, and then they give you the one that's really funny, and they're like. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they get you, they get you, they get you to get out there and make a complete ass of yourself for them. 
So let's talk about your future, your career. Um, <laughs> you know, I can see it going in different directions. We've seen, you know, you've you know, dropped hints about, you know, in the past challenging Joe Lieberman and moving to Connecticut. No, I never said house, that. Yeah. Or other people have. Yeah, other people your, yeah. your people have. Um, so. This is what's wrong with the press. So, um, so, so, I mean, what, what excites you more? House seat, Senate seat, or a great play on Broadway? For the, um, like 10 years from now. I, I, I can't say. I mean, I, I know that um, the, uh, in New York where I live, there's a lot of uh, uh, entitlement. There's a lot of people who have all their moves mapped out, you know, 10 years down the road. Uh, uh, Patterson has obviously taken himself out of the race. Most people assume Andrew's going to win. Uh, I was listening to what I thought was a list of maybe three prominent people who were going to run for the uh, AG job when Andrew leaves the Attorney General's office. And on public radio in New York and NYC, they listed like eight or nine people now who are pretty uh, confident they're going to run for that position. Um, uh, the Senate seat, I mean, Chuck Schumer's not going anywhere. Gillibrand is playing all her cards pretty well. I don't think anybody's assuming she's going to lose. Uh, there are, and this is uh, not, I wouldn't say this is troublesome to me. I think it's unfortunate for people who are uh, competent and, and uh, skilled political types who realize now that what's happened in New York politics is the Gillibrand seat is viewed as the female seat from the New York delegation. There are many, many people, particularly women, who are very powerful forces in, uh, in, in, uh, in politics in New, York, in New York who've said, this seat must be occupied by a woman in perpetuity now. It's a woman, you know, since Hillary broke that barrier. Because Hillary Clinton was the first person to hold statewide elective office in the history of New York. I mean, New York was so backwards that way. I'm not talking about lieutenant governor, which is a ceremonial position, where some women had occupied that position. Both Senate seats, the governorship, AG, controller, never a woman, never, 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 never. And so Hillary was the first. And now people, once that that's been established, um, you hear people in uh, uh, um, New York political life say that uh, they, they don't want Gillibrand to budge, no matter who the, the other candidate is, even though she was appointed but in the office. you're saying all these things. The reality is everyone thought Spitzer would still be governor. I, I'm asking you, well, I can tell just by your body language, how you're talking, that you would love to be a senator from New York. Exactly. Right? That's exactly what I'm saying. And I think you would love that. I resent the hell out of Kristen Gillibrand. It takes a good report. You Done. can tell that. He thinks she waltzed into that role. I can just tell. I can just but she's doing very well. I mean, I, I mean she, she, she's doing, listen, I don't want to, uh, I mean, we had Alphonse D'Amato was a senator in New York for, uh, for, for four terms, and that was the, the dark ages in New York political life. But, 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 but to say that, that, that uh, people have come to me and said, would you move somewhere and run for office? And I, you know, I'm a New Yorker, and I like living in New York, and that's where I'm going to stay. And would you settle for a house seat? <laughs> you make it sound so sexy and so <laughs> exciting. Would I settle for a house seat? You know, I, I mean, I, I, I would see no shame in running for the house uh, and, and uh, and then if things change. See, one thing you realize about uh, uh, Spitzer, whoever thought that Hillary would lose to Obama. I, for one, never dreamed Hillary would lose to Obama. I thought Hillary would win the nomination, and she might have lost to McCain. In, 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 in a, and that's a very kind of a sad reflection on the way, uh, I mean, I had a guy say this comment to me once, which was a very harsh political observation. He said, I said, why do you think Hillary lost to Obama, which I thought was impossible? And he said he felt that, uh, he felt that uh, uh, the tension between the sexes has been going on much longer than tension between the races. <laughs> he said that he believed that, that, people, that, that men as voters were more suspicious of a woman in office than white voters were suspicious, suspicious of a black leader in office. And so when that happened with Hillary Clinton, I never thought she would lose. I never thought she would take an appointment in his, in his, and give up her Senate seat to become Secretary of State. I never thought that would happen. I assume she, she would have teed herself up in such a way, which she could still do, that if Obama lost this next election, she could uh, uh, position herself as a candidate again later on. But uh, just, just to finish this, which is that, that she, um, uh, so anything can happen. I mean, you turn around and Hillary's gone, she vacates a seat, Spitzer's gone. You, you never know what, what the future holds. I know students have a million questions. Why don't you start lining up? I'm going to ask you a couple quick questions while people are lining up. Number one is, 
you and I were both, you don't know this, you and I were both born in 1958. The thing that bothers me about that is for the first time we have a president who is younger than I am. Does that bother you or is it just me? <clears throat> well, my dad said to me once, he said, you know you're getting old when all the cops and all the ball players are, old, are younger than you. And I reached that age quite a while ago. Um, it doesn't bother me. I mean, one thing I will honestly say is, I, for one, um, I wasn't happy about the health care uh, 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 program. I wasn't happy about that uh, uh, legislation. Because I believed, as much as I thought it was important, as much as I thought health care was important, and I'm glad that it passed <clears throat> once they got it, <clears throat> once they launched that, I'm glad that they were successful. Although I believe that energy uh, uh, policy in this country was far more important in the immediate sense. Having spent $750 million on a war in the Middle East, where there's a war for oil, make no mistake about that, uh, going into Iraq, I mean, um, uh, and, and that's a whole complicated issue about Pakistan and the Taliban versus Al Qaeda and so forth in the Middle East. I think that 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 uh, energy policy is just as I think campaign finance reform is the linchpin of the political problems in this country. I think that energy reform is the linchpin of all the economic problems in this country. Do you think Obama has been a successful president? I think so. Obama. Obama to me is successful on two levels. One, I think. He prevailed. He won the health care issue, which was that politics is about wins and losses, and that was a big win for him, perception-wise. But I also want to mention, and, and I don't expect people here to agree with me, but I also am deeply, deeply, deeply admiring of Obama's cool and his disposition, and that he doesn't take the bait from these seething, hissing animals who are spitting on him and kicking him yeah. and throwing tomatoes at him on the stage. I mean, we've, we've never lived in a time which is more unelegant as the time we live in now, and is more unkind than the time we live in now. Turn on the TV, and more and more of these reality shows are two things. They're unscripted to save on having to pay members of the WGA a living wage. They, the producers put these people on these reality shows and just say, okay, go and they save on actors, and they save on costs. But the other thing is that there are shows in which people humiliate each other. There's a lot of humiliation on television now. And I think that in this age, which seems to be such an, an inelegant age, Obama has stayed cool and collected, and he didn't take the bait. We all know that there are men who've occupied that office who've been some pretty furniture-smashing maniacs. <laughs> I mean, I can name a few that I have friends of mine have worked in some of these administrations. These guys are throwing ashtrays across the room and screaming. They're, they're stripping the, their lamps. Yeah. They're stripping the paint off the wall. They're screaming so loud. And they're so frustrated about the way they've been dealt with by their political opposites and by the press. Ahem. And, um, <laughs> the, uh, um, uh, and I'm, I'm, I am deeply, deeply, deeply admiring of how Obama has stayed calm and not let, take in the bait and let them get the best of him. Final question before we go to the students, and that is for all these um, students here who are going on to careers, um, what career advice would you give them as they embark on their, um, their careers? And you have to do it in uh, Jack Donaghy character, <laughs> your 30 rat Ross <clears throat> character. So if they're coming to you for a job, Jack, what, do you, what are you looking for? Um, from the time you get your first job till you're about 45, 50, go strong equities, big into equities. <laughs> 50, switch to bonds and securities. <laughs> big risks, 25 to 50, reducing that risk, 50 to 65, 65, you're out. <laughs> go all cash. Let's go to our first question. Please identify yourself, and as usual, no statements, just a quick question. Sure. Um, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
my name is Jeanette Kahiti. I'm a mid-career MPA here, which means that we actually have work experience, and so I'm actually well diversified in my portfolio. Um, so similar to Rick, I did some research and getting prepared for today. I watched Pete Schweddy's um, Delicious Dish. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I'm actually very impressed with you. I think you're smart, you're good looking, and uh, you're also funny. <laughs> what? Where, where's the dorm room again? I say, I'll be there have later. You, have you been to the JFK uh, dorm room? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, uh, hey. <laughs> I'm actually trying to get a job on SNL, so if it helps, uh, I'll definitely be there later. <laughs> Um, so anyway, I, I was just kidding. Um, my question is, uh, you know, what regrets have you had professionally and personally? And you don't have to be like, you know, the typical what the media likes to talk about, but maybe something special like I wish I would have flossed more or eaten better, um, just to get a little bit more flavor. I, I say what the you think same about. thing to people now. I say, in your life, I mean, especially if you're young, the pain that you will feel from not committing to something that you might have committed to is greater than the pain you will feel from committing to something and you found out you were wrong. No risk, no reward. You're in this business, you're in this school, you're gonna get out of school, you're gonna have a degree from Harvard. Boo hoo. <laughs> you know? And you're gonna have a degree from one of the greatest universities in human history and you're gonna walk out that door and you've gotta make choices, you can't do, I mean, we live in a world now where I notice a lot of young people, they got like five or six careers going before they're 35 years old. You gotta really figure out who you are and decide what you wanna do, decide, and, and be honest, I mean, like a lot of people are who work in the financial markets, is money important to you? You wanna make a lot of money? Go make a lot of money. If money isn't important to you and you wanna go work in publishing, and uh, all of my friends who are poor in publishing, you know, they all work in, <laughs> Work in publishing, but I mean, but, but my, my, my advice to people is commit. And then if, you, if it doesn't work out, you can change courses. But I find people who are the most unhappy at my age, because you're gonna be my age, believe it or not, one of these days, is are people who are the, the regrets that they didn't commit. They're sorry they didn't take the chances they wish they took. Thank you, yeah. sir. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Sandeep, um, and my question is, um, I'm curious if you followed the Scott Brown election from Massachusetts yes. and what your thoughts were about that. And it would be great if you could answer in a Boston accent. <laughs> <laughs> what was her name? Who, uh, Mokley? Mokley? Who was Coakley. Coakley, rather. What was her first name? Matha? Was it Matha? Yeah, that's the best I could do. Matha, Mokley. Coakley. Um, uh, well, I, I, yeah, I did follow that election because it was to, to replace uh, Ted's seat, and uh, um, it didn't surprise me. It didn't surprise me. I mean, it was the real classic kind of parasympathetic rebound. I mean, so many years of this dynastic group of people controlling that seat and owning that seat, and, uh, um, and they went and got a guy who... If you watch, I, I say to people, the subliminal message on TV is, is, is incontrovertible. And that is it's almost in a way, you're watching the TV with the sound off whether you want to or not. And Scott Brown was more Kennedy-esque than Coakley was. Isn't it interesting that the guy that beamed more of a kind of a, of, of a, kind of a, 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 a winning quality won, whether he was Republican or Democrat. And I think the Republicans are hungry for that guy. I think they need a, 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 a moderate or not too far right of center Republican um, uh, who, who, who may go for it in uh, the next election because they have, because all they have other than that is, uh, is uh, Caribou Barbie. Okay, why don't we go up, up, up there? Hi, Mr. Baldwin. My name is Kurt. I'm a junior undergraduate here. And uh, so I'm a big fan of the show, and uh, I know you How play. How did you get that kind of fancy loge box you're in up there? <laughs> uh, I was invited up here, actually. Right. It's actually very awkward between, standing between people like this. But, yeah. you know. <laughs> so I'm um, a big fan of the show, and I know you play a, a staunch Republican on, on uh, 30 Rock. And I was wondering if political satire was like, originally supposed to be a part of the humor for 30 Rock, or if that's something that you, know, you brought to the table and um, you know, is it fun for you? Well, no, no, the, the, the writers on the show, uh, Robert Carlock, who went to Harvard, uh, is the uh, other head writer with Tina, and Matt Hubbard went to Harvard. I mean, I'm not joking when I say that the preponderance of the writers went to Harvard, or, 
and they came through the Lampoon. Tina went to UVA and was an actress and worked at uh, um, the Second City in, uh, in uh, Chicago. Um, and, and, the, and the political quotient, I mean, like any TV show, you can look at a hit TV show, even like Friends or Will and & Grace, and watch it in its first season, and then watch it in its fourth season, and the actors who play the roles are almost unrecognizable in the choices they make. The first year where people are, are doing a show, they're really finding what works. That's kind of the condition of doing a, a long-running TV show. And, uh, and they get more and more comfortable, and they make more and more choices, and they become more vivid in what they do. And, uh, and, and that commentary about not just Donaghy as a Republican, but the GE mentality, the Six Sigma mentality that we send up there. Because my character is a combination of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, a GE executive and Lauren Michaels, who is the producer of our show in terms of lifestyle, because Lauren is one of those guys who has like a tuxedo in his glove compartment. You know, <laughs> just goes everywhere in New York and just lives this kind of like fabulous life. But, uh, um, but the... Uh, um, but we, but we do pull our punches with that a lot, I must say, because it is network. I mean, one of the things I'm most proud about the show is that it is a network show, so we have to keep it, we have to walk a certain line, you know. On cable, uh, cable is where you can say whatever you want to say. Cable is where you can say the F-bomb anytime you want to. And people th think that that makes things more real and more vivid. And I'm very proud of the fact that we've had to play it a little more carefully, find other ways to say that. The things we wanted to How say much that, that were show scripted versus. Oh, it's um, all, we say every word, word, word for word is written. Yeah. Word for word. Oh, it's, it's all scripted. No we, we, we shoot it as written, and then we might have some, uh, uh, some ad libs or alt. But, but, but the agreement we have with the writers is we, write, we say it exactly as written. And you want to. I mean, it's really that funny. But I mean, I. But like, I. I uh, in that world of doing comedy, you know, sometimes I would go see a show like, uh, I'd go see Brian Dennehy do. Uh, uh, an O'Neill play on Broadway, and I'd say, God, how does he do that? You know, three and a half hours of wringing your guts out on stage at night in front of these people eight times a week. When you do a comedy for five seasons, and you're ready to go in the other direction and do something a little different. Because the thing about the show is we play in this kind of fizzy, kooky key every day, you know? <laughs> but the good news is, is that, uh, like, especially with SNL, it's the only place you get to say certain things. I mean, there's just no other venue. You know, I, I mean, I did this sketch uh, of, uh, of uh, the guy running for governor once. And the guy is in his house, and he hears an intruder downstairs, and he comes downstairs, and he sees a shadow, and he shoots the shadow, and he kills a dog. And the front page of the newspaper the next day says, gubernatorial candidate kills Lassie. And you see my daughter going, Dad, you killed Lassie. You shot Lassie. And I'm at a press conference, and I say, I'm sorry. Uh, accidentally, I shot and killed Lassie. Uh, that was a terrible mistake. Uh, but I do think that this campaign has a lot of things to say that are important things to say. And uh, this woman comes up to me holding a baby. And she's saying to me, sir, 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 can I talk to you, sir? And I go, listen, lady, could you just? And, I, and, and she goes, oh my god, he yelled at my baby. Gubernatorial candidate yells at a baby. <laughs> I go to a press conference. The American flag is there behind me. And I say, I'm very sorry. I killed Lassie. I yelled at a baby. But I still believe my candidacy. We have a lot of important things to say. People throw eggs at me. I kind of recoil from the throwing eggs at me. An egg hits me in the butt. I've got egg running down my pants. I reach to the nearest thing, which is the American flag, and I wipe the egg off. <clears throat> Gubernatorial candidate wipes his ass with the American flag. <laughs> and the last beat, which was not in the script, the writers came up to me on the night, on Saturday night, and the guy hands me a page and goes, we've got one more beat for you. The woman with the baby's going to come back. And sure enough, I go, I know that I killed Lassie, yelled at a baby, and wiped my ass with the American flag. I still believe that my candidacy has some important things to say about the issues today. Boo! They throw eggs at me. The woman comes up with the baby. Sir, sir! I grab the baby and I wipe myself with the baby. <clears throat> Gubernatorial candidate wipes himself with a baby. It's like, where else could you possibly <laughs> find this kind of insanity? You know what I mean? And that's why I keep going back and doing the show over and over again, because it's just so stupid and ridiculous, <laughs> but funny. 
Uh, Mr. Baldwin, uh, I'm Jonathan Holly. I'm a senior at the college, and I have to agree, you are very good looking and very funny. Oh, thank you. Uh, the other day, You're A.O. Not Scott. The door. <laughs> <laughs> the other nice day. Nice try. <laughs> what can I, how, how could I not? Uh, the other day, A.O. Scott at the New York Times chose Glengarry Glen Ross as his movie of the day, not only because it's a great film, but also because he noted that it was very timely, even today, as a look at greed and corruption. Now, as an actor, do you find yourself more drawn to projects that seem more politically relevant or socially conscious, or do you try not to mix the performance with the politics and prefer to look more at the material rather than what it might say about the times in which you're making it? I think you do the best of what's laid out in front of you, uh, and you want to go to work. Like if I only did films that I really, really believed in and I thought that there was an opportunity to make a great film, I would have worked a lot less and I would have stayed home a lot more. You know, the, 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 Dustin Hoffman once made a comment to me, I was reading a screenplay in a reading for producers and, and uh, uh, the director of the film and I was gonna potentially do this film with him and he told me the greatest line, he said, he said, all of us are in line in this town, some of us are just in a shorter line. And the competition for worthy material, it's really, really tough. It's really tough. And I've, I, and I've been lucky where I did some films that um, I liked, and I thought that it was smart. I did some films that were, you know, if everybody came to work every day and did their best work, the most we could still hope for was mediocrity. I've done a smaller number of them which were just really garbage, you know, which were really crap, but it was a paycheck. But one thing I think also people don't keep in mind is that people in the film business don't huddle up. I mean, there's some great, great people. When, when you do a film, especially you learn that film is a very collaborative process. There's 150, 200 people who work in film, and, uh, and, and, and you marvel at how skilled the, 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 the wardrobe people are, and the designers, and the prop people, and, the, and the so forth, and the technical people, the cameramen, especially the, the directors of photography. Um, I, I can honestly say, if you ask me what one thing was, that was my greatest pride, my greatest source of, uh, of, uh, of satisfaction in the business. It was the directors of photography I got to work with. I worked with the greatest film cameramen of their generation. It's, uh, I, I, can't, I can't even name all of them, but like what, the guy that shot Glenn Gary is Juan Ruiz Anchia, who was Hector Babenco's DP on many, many films for, for Babenco. And uh, uh, it's just such a great honor to be photographed by them, because it's a movie. You know, how you look at it and how they shoot it, it's a big, component of it, and, uh, uh, but um, the, uh, the film business is tough that way, you know? And it's really, and I must say that the, the, the opportunity to do great work in the film business, this is a big reason why I went to do the TV show, it was, it, it was just getting tougher. You know, I haven't seen, like we did the movie It's Complicated, and I did the movie It's Complicated to work with Meryl. You know, I just wanted to work with Meryl. And uh, I told her, I said, I really thought what I would, if I was going to be working with you, you know, we would be on horses, and I'd have a sword, and, <laughs> you know, we would be speaking in accents, and it'd be like, you know, big pennants flapping in the breeze on the castle and everything. We'd be doing some period, some achingly beautiful period film. And uh, we wound up doing this Nancy Myers uh, uh, romantic comedy. It was great. I enjoyed working with her. Let me just ask you one thing. Since I stayed up till 1 a.m., as I said, to watch you. Yes, Rick, we're aware of that. So, um, <laughs> so I have to ask a question about that. One of my favorite parts was when you sort of rekindled this romance with your ex-wife, Meryl Streep, <coughs> in a bar in New York. And it just, you could just really feel the, the fun of it. I was having fun watching you two drink all night and have fun. Now, to, to get in the mood for that role, were you drinking? Were you smoking something? <laughs> were you, no, how do you... How do you get loose enough to do that with her? I have, I have a friend of mine who's a film director who did a film with a great actor. He's a very famous actor. I don't want to embarrass him. And he's a great actor. And he said to the prop people, and he was younger in his career, admittedly. He, he, he had made films, but he was still relatively young in his career. And he said to the, to the prop guy, unbeknownst to the director, he said to the prop guy, he said, do me a favor. He said, give me a glass, a little bit in there, just an inch. I just want to get the taste in my mouth. Give me like just an inch. <laughs> And he gets this glass, and he starts drinking booze on the set of this film. And by lunch, he's puking all over the bed. I mean, he's like really sick. It's like he's been drinking since like, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning. You know, a little taste. Just want to get a little taste in my mouth. 
<laughs> and now he's like nauseous. I mean, you don't do that, what you're saying. You, know, you have to imagine, and you know, because once you imbibe that, there's no turning back. But the, 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 but the thing about it is that's, that's important to remember is, and I want to beat this to death, but the thing is, is, in that movie, this is not about a guy that wants to have sex with his ex-wife. This is about a guy who loves his ex-wife. I mean, what, what made the film possible for me, I've read scripts and I've said, you don't want me. I, I'm not right for I'm not the guy. I don't think I can bring what you want. Or I don't want to do what they, what the, you know, like if you read the script, I did the movie The Cooler. And in the movie The Cooler, they gave me the script and it said that my character kicks the pregnant woman in the stomach. You know that the woman who's pregnant, she's there, I forget the actress's name, and you, you walk up and I know that she's scamming me and I kick her, like, like kung fu style. I kick this woman really hard in the stomach. I, I read the page, it goes, kicks the woman in the stomach. I close the script, I call my agent, and I was like incensed. I go, are you out of your mind? <laughs> I kick the pregnant woman in the stomach? And he said, read the next page, you fucking idiot. You know what I mean? And I read the next page, and I realize that she's faking, and that she's not pregnant, and that she's padded. And she's part of the scam. So, he, you know, you read a screenplay, and it says, your agent will say, here's the script, and you're going to play Henry. You're going to play Henry. <laughs> I hope you really like it, because they offered you so much money. And you read it, and it says, Henry steps onto a kindergarten bus with a flamethrower. <laughs> and kills everybody. And you go, I don't want to do that. <laughs> but in, it's complicated. It, it, I wouldn't have done the movie if I was a guy, I, I literally wouldn't have done the movie if I was a guy who wanted to just seduce his ex-wife for, for vanity's sake. He was a guy <clears throat> that still loved his ex-wife. And the great thing is, is that Merrill is very easy to love, so it was a very easy job to do. Thank you, Mr. Burke and Mr. Baldwin, um, for coming. I've really enjoyed and appreciated your authenticity. My name is Rebecca Hawk, and I'm a mid-career student here. So I really appreciate when you talk to all the young people who are students here, because um, you and I share a couple things in common. One I'm not going to announce out loud to everybody, but the other one. <laughs> The other one is that um, I come from Oregon and Washington State, and I was on the board of the Columbia Riverkeeper before I came here to school. So I uh, and have done environmental work there. So I know you have, and you announced that here earlier. Your work with um, Riverkeepers Alliance, and and I think the Hudson Riverkeeper with the Kennedys. So um, could you just comment on? Um, um, I don't know how you're going to relate to this to a movie story or anything, but you know, I was looking for how uh, what you see about the state of environmental work in our country, <coughs> leadership of those issues that concern our um, waters of our country. And well, here you had the issue was in the Times, I guess today or yesterday. I had a, I had two papers with me today. The one we finished reading yesterday's paper on the plane, and they had. <clears throat> the article about hydro, uh, about, about uh, wind power, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, how the Europeans are so far ahead of us, and we're you know, kind of behind the, uh, the curve here. And they talked, of course, about what was going on off the coast of uh, Massachusetts, and how people had uh, killed that project, which was unfortunate. Because they did the same thing on the south shore of Long Island, where I'm from. They were going to site these, these, these uh, turbines out there. I mean, these things are the size of the Statue of Liberty and they sink them down into the, into the ocean, into these uh, bases that they build down there. They're enormous. And uh, uh, that was used as part of the uh, propaganda against them. They were like, these things are the size of the Statue of Liberty. They're going to be sticking out of the beach, you know. They're going to be right on top of you while you're swimming there, <laughs> you know. And uh, um, the truth of the matter is, it's a question of perception. You know, I mean, if you present something to the American people, and, and there is a, uh, uh, a, a, a need on the part of the environmental, the pro-environmental movement, or whatever you want to call it, there's a need for them to reword their public relations, I think, and to, and to uh, 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 um, you know, have the next generation of their PR campaign. Uh, because I said to them, I, for example, if I saw those wind turbines off the coast of Long Island, they were going to be pretty far out, you know, several hundred yards, you know, several thousand yards out in the distance. 
because uh, they were saying in this article in the Times how the coast of the United States is shallow for a long, long period that makes these things really worthwhile. Um, and, they, and I said, if I saw those things, those things would have made me happy. I'd see wind turbines turning out off the coast of the ocean. I mean, I don't want them everywhere, but I mean, if we had them sighted in certain areas, they would have been these symbols to me of our energy independence, of the, of, of the fact that the United States doesn't need to go and fight bogus wars for oil anymore, and we would increase our, our uh, uh, renewables. And Bobby Kennedy Jr., who if you go to his Waterkeeper Alliance benefit, every year they have a ski event in Banff in Canada. And I go every year, I'm one of the co-hosts with Bobby, and Bobby Kennedy gives up and he essentially gives the same speech every year. I mean, he might modify it per certain current events. And Bobby speaks, and you never, stop crying every time. You cry every time he gives this speech. And one of the things he says in this speech is this idea of how we market our ideas and how if you told people that you weren't going to be able to smoke in a New York bar or a New York restaurant 30 years ago, they would have told you you were out of your mind. And if eventually you told them you weren't going to be able to smoke in any building in New York that's an office building, that, that smokers would have to gather like outlaws in the pouring rain and stand under the eaves of buildings and smoke in the rain and the frigid weather, uh, they would have said, you're out of your mind. But that's exactly the way we live in New York right now. And Bobby Kennedy's, my favorite one, is he said, is if you this is Bobby's favorite one, he says, and if you told New Yorkers that you were going to put a plastic bag over your hand and bend over and pick up your dog's droppings on the street and then reverse the bag and close it inside the bag, and then go to the nearest garbage can and throw out. He said, people would have told you you're insane. You're going to clean up your dog's crap on the street every day. Everybody in New York is going to do that. And, and, and yet that is the law. In New York, you must do that. You make something a reality for people politically and economically, and they will adjust to it. And that's what we need to do with renewable energy. If you're going to have to have wind turbines off the coast of Nantucket, that's a price we're going to have to pay in order to have, I think, a, a better energy policy in this country. Sir. Hi, um, my name is David Raper from the Kennedy School. Um, welcome both to our school. Thanks for coming. Um, my question relates to the recent South Park episode that you may have heard about, uh, where there was some uh, depiction, or at least poking fun at, um, prohibitions against depicting Muhammad in television. and. A, was either to make a point about free speech or to, to be humorous. And just after listening to some of your comments tonight, partly talking about acting as a medium for change to empathise with people and you know, engage with people, but also the freedom that you described uh, being part of Saturday Night Live and if you like being able to say almost whatever you wanted on, uh, on a cable, cable uh, television. I just wondered if you had any views on that and in particular about uh, you know, performers, offence, and free speech, and whether there are any lines or how you would approach that sort of issue. That's a long, uh, that's a, that's would require a pretty long answer. I mean, I, I know that the people from South Park, they have an uncanny ability to find a really raw nerve. Parker and Stone are very good at that. I mean, I, I never had anybody, I never was reamed so hard in my life than in the movie Team America. They, they really, they shoved it up there to the shoulder, you know what I mean, when they, when they got me on that show. And, uh, um, and they're very good at that. I mean, they're really wickedly uh, satirical people. And I think that they sit around and it just comes relatively easy to them, uh, these kinds of nerves they can touch uh, that way. Um, I think we live in a, in a time when people are very sensitive about their religious views regardless. Uh, and, and for a kind of a, uh, uh, unrelated reasons. You know, I'm a Catholic, I grew up a Catholic, I still go to church, I'm a Catholic. Mm -hmm. And yet I see what's going on in the Catholic Church. It's tough, it's tough. The, the Catholic Church once again is coming to a, a, an impasse where you wonder if, <clears throat> Wherever I travel around this country, Catholic clergy now are all, uh, uh, I take that back, not all, Catholic clergy are overwhelmingly third world men. They're African men, they're, they're, they're Southeast Asian men. The church I go to in, in Santa Monica, St. Monica, my, my priest there was a, was a Vietnamese man, uh, recruiting people to serve in the, that, uh, uh, in the 
uh, priesthood is becoming really problematic for them. And uh, whether they may get to the point where they might have to have a, a female priests. I mean, I, I, I don't know what they're going to do because it seems to be kind of coming apart in a way. But I think, I think at the same time, it hurts people. You know what I mean? I mean, you, you want to believe that there's an institution like that. I mean, I, I, you talk about this thing with Parker and Stone, and uh, there's a huge Muslim population in this country, and they must be profoundly, I can't imagine what it's like to be a Muslim in America right now. They must be profoundly sensitive to how they're made to feel here, because I live in New York, <clears throat> and there is a tension between uh, uh, New Yorkers, non-Muslim New Yorkers, and Muslim New Yorkers. You know, you, you, I live in New York, and I don't have to explain to anybody. I can't describe to you, if you live in New York, how palpable it is, how people still drive through Manhattan, and they still look at that spot in the sky, and those buildings are gone. And it still works on them, and nothing's been put there, and nothing's been replaced, and there's been no healing of that event. And no political leadership in New York has abetted the healing of that event. They, they think they have for the victims and their families and so forth. But for the rest of New York, uh, uh, you know, I'll never forget the day of the attack, 9-11. People said, you know, New York is like Israel now. We're going to have to maybe, are we going to have to live with an ongoing threat all the time of some kind of terrorist activity? And uh, um, I feel that whenever you touch the nerve that's related to people's religious beliefs, there's just a lot of gas on the floor. People get very uptight. And, uh, um, and I'm sensitive to that. You know, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to, Mario Cantone. You know, how many people know Mario Cantone? The comedian, you do. God bless you, by the way, in the tie over there. All the more arcane things I'm mentioning, she's nodding, she knows. Mario Cantone uh, has a comedy routine. You should go on YouTube and watch his comedy routine about the experience after 9-11 of having a Muslim cab driver. He, just, he has this like horribly uh, racist routine he does. But, he, but he's trying to diffuse that feeling about how uncomfortable people in New York are. Are we done? Two, two more quick, very quick questions. <coughs> you and you, and then we're done. Go. All right, howdy, Mr. Baldwin. Thank you for being here. Um, uh, my name is Jordan. I'm an undergraduate at the college, and as the resident of a border state, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the recent and very controversial anti-immigration bill that was passed in Arizona. Well, I mean, I, I think it's, it's easy for people to talk about what they would do or wouldn't. I mean, I think it's wrong, but I, I, I think it's easy for us to talk about what we would do or wouldn't do, but we don't live in Arizona. I mean, I, 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 I think that what the bill that was put forth was a mistake. This is the same state that refused to honor Martin Luther King's birthday. I think it's interesting that the senator from the state that wouldn't recognize Martin Luther King's birthday lost the White House to an African-American candidate. Uh, but I think that, um, I think that we have to have an immigration policy that's going to let more people in because we're never going to stop them from coming in. And if we offer them some kind of legal status or semi-legal status or some kind of conditional status, that's going to be the answer because I just don't see that it's going to stop. I, I, they're, they're going to find... Pe pe people have wanted to come to... This country, in spite of everything, in spite of the fact that if, you, that, that, that if you go to Europe, for example, my friend lives in Paris, and if you go to New, uh, Europe, for example, on any given day, the, represent the representation of America is like this big rigged casino. <laughs> you know, the Goldman Sachs, everybody, they're, they're just calling the shots, and they run the country, and Americans are just fools and idiots, and their government is corrupt, and they have a very bleak view of America right now. The bailout was a complete joke. They should have let AIG die. The Europeans, they should have let GM die. You, some of my friends who were very serious in the banking profession in Europe, they had a very harsh view of that. And yet, that's in the media. And there'll always be somewhat of a chasm between what mainstream people feel and what the media depicts. And for mainstream people, uh, you know, for average people, America is still a place they want to come to that has tremendous opportunity. It still really is a kind of a, 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 a kind of gleaming uh, goal in their lives, destination for them, and I don't think that's ever going to change for the time being. 
Hi, I'm Tom Snyder. I'm from upstate, if you couldn't tell from the plaid, um, upstate New York, that is. And I was wondering um, what, you, what your Don't thoughts on... Don't put yourself on... down like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from the Syracuse area. I was wondering what your thoughts on... What? Undergrad. Undergrad. I'm a freshman. Where sorry. in Syracuse? Uh, do you know where Fayetteville is? Of course. My mother lives in Camillus. Really? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I was wondering um, like, what your thoughts were on revitalizing a lot of uh, what Cuomo can do to revitalize um, a lot of upstate New York in terms of politics and economics. I know this is a sort of a broad question for the end, but especially like living up to his father's. I just flew up to Camillus uh, at my sister's request uh, to uh, attend a press conference because Honeywell, which was purchased by Allied Signal, the famous uh, manufacturing corporation, Allied, before they merged with Signal, Allied Chemical dumped uh, uh, 1.3 million cubic feet of chemicals into the Onondaga Lake in Syracuse. It's the major body of water there. It's where the Syracuse University crew team rose. It's the only certified dead body of water in New York State. It's considered, other than near the Columbia River, near Hanford, it's considered one of the most polluted, one of the most contaminated bodies of water in the country. And uh, Allied Signal bought Honeywell, but then took Honeywell's name. So Honeywell are the ones who signed the agreement with the, D the DEC in New York State to spend $451 million to remediate. They're going to suck the toxins out of the lake now after they've been litigating for decades. I mean, this is a real sore subject with the people there. But so starved are these people for jobs there that what they agreed was Honeywell said, but we're going to take the toxins out of here. And we have these waste beds. We have these dump sites in what were exurban areas and what were semi-rural areas 30 years ago, which since then have been developed, and there's homes there. A section of the town of Camillus, where my sister lives, is a development that borders this waste bed. These waste beds are these, like the size of a football field, like these big troughs, where they had dumped heavy chlorines and heavy sodiums from the, from the soda ash process that was famous in that area for a century. And people are wondering if the sites where this stuff was dumped had become inert. In other words, they're claiming, Honeywell, that we own this property. There are 13 of them on a, on a, on a tax map of the area, on a survey, and there, or 15 of them. <clears throat> and they're claiming, Honeywell, they're saying, well, we own this property, and they're dump sites, so we're going to suck the toxins out of Onondaga Lake, and we're going to put them in these waste beds that we own that are already contaminated sites. And I went up there to urge them to, first of all, get some experts in there to determine, are those sites still contaminated? Or have the materials that have gone into those sites have they become inert, as they often do? Or and are you going to be recontaminating a site? And also, is there any consideration about the fact that there's been a lot of development in this area now and there's homes built where there weren't homes before? And the problem is that they're so hard up for money up there and they're so hard up for jobs up there that they want Honeywell to spend the $451 million in the town rather than cart the stuff down to Texas to a dedicated waste site where you would normally send it, which would cost them twice as much money, and which Honeywell is refusing to do, and which the state DEC is not pressuring Honeywell to do, and the state DEC has signed off on this. The same state DEC, by the way, who let GE bump all the PCBs in the Hudson and so forth. So the issue with central New York is what lengths they're willing to go to to create jobs there. Once Carrier left Syracuse in terms of manufacturing, they still have their R&D there, it became very precarious for them. So it's a really tricky issue. Yes or no, are you a fan of Andrew Cuomo's? He keeps coming up today and I can't tell. Um, I, ga I gather no. I gather no. 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 No, I'm a fan of anybody who will be the Democratic candidate there, there, for an there, there you later. have it. Thank okay. you, Victor. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Alex. <coughs> Thanks very thank much. You. Really appreciate it. Um, thank you. Really appreciate your time, especially on zero, zero honoraria here. If we could give Alec 30 seconds so he can get out, so he's not mobbed, so he can get to that dorm room, which is very important. Um, so, and please, everyone, I implore you not to knock on his door tonight, unless there's been a prearranged agreement with someone. <laughs> but um, anyway, so thank you very much. Thank again. you. Thank Take you. care. Thank you. Thanks.
Stoned love.